Two months ago, I had no idea that I would be standing here in Panama with a brand new touring bike. But as you're probably aware, Koga are my personal bike sponsor and they were super keen for me to test ride their latest model, the World Traveler 2.0. Today, we'll be going bumper to bumper on this wild rig. We'll be taking a deep dive into the frame set details as well as the components and all of the small customizations that make this my own. All right, let's start with the heart of the bike, which is always the frame. The first thing you'll notice is the color that I've chosen, which is Madagascar orange. This is a limited edition color for this year, and I selected it because I thought it was elegant, but at the same time, quite understated. If you're a James Bond fan, this is actually the exact color of the villain car in the latest 007 film. The paint is a powder coat, which I've found to be the most durable finish for touring, and the paint detailing is very exquisite. Before riding Kogas, I didn't know that powder coats could be this intricate. The frame is super stiff for touring and it's constructed out of aluminium, which is lighter and more customizable than steel, thanks to the way you can shape the tubes and budding profiles. While some people perceive aluminium to be weak, this is simply a myth. Frame material is just one factor when it comes to strength. What's more important is the frame design and the engineering and the overall build quality. I have no doubt that my Koga can handle the same or even more abuse than what my steel bikes can. I mean, you've seen the type of terrain I ride on aluminium bikes. New for this year are the super smooth welds and these look insane. It looks like the frame is made out of carbon fiber because all of the frame tubes morph into each other. Other new things about the frame are their head tube lengths, which are all 25 millimeters taller. And the World Traveler frame is now derailleur compatible, which just brings in a lower entry point for the Koga bike pricing. The internal cable routing is one thing that differentiates a Koga from any other aluminum touring bike. There are guides inside the down tube all the way to the bottom bracket shell, and these prevent the cables from rattling inside the frame. It keeps the cables hidden away from the elements. It makes the bike look really nice, and it also makes the cables super easy to install. Inside the head tube is a steering limiter, which prevents the handlebars from being able to twist too far with the front panniers. It also makes the bike much more stable with the kickstand deployed. The frame is covered in mounts, including under the top tube, inside the front triangle, and under the down tube. On the fork, there are also two cargo cage mounts if you prefer more of a bike packing setup. My signature handlebars are something I'm super proud of. I actually designed these with Koga, and the idea is that you get the best of a drop handlebar and a flat handlebar. With your hands on the bullhorns or the bar tops, you make your body much more aerodynamic, which allows for faster speeds on smooth surfaces. In the grips, you can take advantage of the big steering leverage to maneuver the front of the bike with ease. I couldn't ride the difficult terrain I do and speed along the highways without a handlebar like this. I use five different hand positions on these bars. So in the bullhorns, which are actually angled inwards, I'm either at the very end or close to the base. On the bar tops, which are angled backwards, I'm jammed either into the nook of the bullhorn or much closer near the stem. And then there are the grips for when I need to access the brakes or gears. The Ergon GC1 grips are designed specifically for a swept back handlebar like this, and they are a game changer. They actually feel like they've been custom molded for my hands. There's a rise in the middle that cups inside my palm and a wing out the back that distributes the hand pressure over a larger surface area. I've also cut down the right hand grip so that I can get a bit more space around the base of my bullhorns. In the middle of the bar, I'm using a double bar tape wrap to squeeze the maximum comfort out of the front of the bike. As I have large-ish hands, I definitely prefer the feel of a bigger handhold. Inside my head tube is my Dynamo Hub USB charger by Sync. 
a little ratcheting door reveals the USB-C charging port and this is actually the most powerful charger available for cycling at speeds under 20 kilometers an hour. You can generate enough power from these to run your smartphone on full screen brightness in navigation mode between just 14 and 17 kilometers an hour. As the smartphone needs about 12 kilometers an hour to get a smooth charge, there's actually a buffer battery hidden inside my head tube, which provides backup power while I crawl slowly up hills. And if I cycle at 17 kilometers an hour, it takes about seven hours to fill a 5,000 mAh power bank. The low stack height of my Plug 5 Plus charger allows me to mount my smartphone on my stem. I use a quad lock case, which uses a spring loaded mount to ensure the phone will always stay on the bars, even on the rough terrain. And with this kit, it's just super easy to mount and remove my phone from my bike. To power my USB charger and my lights is a hub dynamo from Schmidt. These are easily the best in the business, offering unparalleled performance and by far the best reliability. The biggest change compared to my previous bike are the 27.5 by 2.4 inch tires, which are up from 29 by 2.0. The fatter rubber is basically a trade-off between on-road and off-road speed. But given I'm finding myself on more off-road trails than I initially expected, these will definitely be a welcome addition. I still do compromise by using slick Schwalb Supermoto X tires because my multi-year trips still have a really big percentage on the pavement. And these allow me to comfortably ride about a thousand kilometers per week if I need. I run the tires at four bar on smooth surfaces and I can drop them to about two bar on bumpy roads. I actually prefer to use tubes with any touring tire just because they're that puncture resistant. I haven't had a puncture in the last 16 months in fact, but it also means I don't have to mess around with seating a tire and I don't have to bother with changing the sealant. You'll have noticed that I almost never hold back when it comes to riding rough terrain and the key to my strong wheels are both my super stiff rims and even spoke tension. The ride rims are definitely the stiffest and most burly rims in existence, but the downside is that they often weigh 30 to 40% more than other touring rims. They're so stiff, they almost never go out of true, and I rarely ever break spokes either. My wheels are laced with 36 spokes, which are double butted and roll off hub specific. I carry two front and two rear spokes as spares. The drivetrain is centered around a roll off 14 speed internal gearbox hub. I've been using these for the past 100,000 kilometers and would find it really hard to travel with anything else. All the gears are sealed away from the elements. They're almost maintenance free. They're not susceptible to external damage and they build into a super strong wheel. The roll off hubs usually add about half a kilo when compared to derailers and they have a similar drive efficiency to a one by drivetrain. I'm using a Gates belt drivetrain on my bike and again these offer almost zero maintenance and I can get more than 30,000 kilometers out of a drivetrain which is three to four times further than I could with a chain. I've selected a 50 to 22 tooth drive ratio which will give me under 18 gear inches and with that I can cycle uphill at about five kilometers an hour with quite a reasonable cadence. I run my belt drivetrains at a super low tension, which isn't recommended by Gates or Koga, but it reduces the amount of resistance in the belt drivetrain so that it's comparable to that of a chain. I can get away with this because the Koga frame has such a stiff rear triangle and my pedaling technique is quite smooth. Even at this crazy low tension, I can't make the belt skip and I consider myself a pretty strong cyclist. I'm carrying one spare belt, which is around 80 grams and fits into the pocket of one of my panniers. If I need a new chainring or cog, I'll have to get them shipped in, but in the last 10 years, I haven't ever had to do this. I'm using the new Gates crankset with a direct mount chainring, which looks amazing, and I'm looking forward to seeing if it can handle my abuse. I'm also testing this belt care stick to see if it can keep my belt running smoother and quieter for longer. When you travel off-road, your pedals always take a huge beating. 
and the most durable clip-in pedals I found are Shimano XT. I clean and re-grease these pedals every two years and they always go back to feeling like new. I've put over 50,000 kilometers into a set of these before, so I don't actually know their limit. Contrary to popular belief, at constant rates of power on constant gradients, there is no advantage to clipping in. But I choose to clip in because it helps me generate short bursts of power on steep off-road climbs. It also keeps my feet in place on rough terrain and I can optimize my foot positioning on my pedals. My brakes are Shimano XT Hydros. These have been great to me the last two years. They have ample power and I've found that they need to be bled about once per year on average. I prefer to use scented metal brake pads as they tend to last about two to three times longer than any organic pads I've ever found. I'm currently testing the Cane Creek EE Silk suspension seat post. It's barely heavier than a carbon flex seat post, but it has an adjustable spring rate to suit your body weight. I like that it only has 20 millimeters of travel as I've found most other suspension seat posts just offer too much vertical movement for my liking. My Velo seat was purchased in Cambodia on a whim. It was the only seat I could find in a local bike shop and it turned out to be the perfect shape for my bum. It has been on many bikes over the years and will hopefully survive many more bikes to come. I use Schmidt Dynamo lights on all of my touring bikes. The E-Deluxe 2 front light has enough brightness to light my way even at 5 km an hour while I'm crawling up a hill. The beam pattern is great for the mix of riding I do. It uses a reflector to make sure that the light doesn't go into the eyes of the drivers and other cyclists coming the other way. The rear light is bright and also nice and compact and the wiring actually runs up the inside of my rack. Mud guards are a must for me. They do get clogged up with mud a handful of times per year, but I don't mind because they keep me dry and clean all the other times when the road is super wet. I use steel racks on all of my touring bikes because along with your wheels, they're often the most likely component to fail on a bike trip. Tubus definitely make the best racks in the business. I've never broken any of mine, but if you do manage to break a rack, they'll send replacements anywhere in the world for free for the first five years. My bottle cages are Triple B fuel tank XLs, but unfortunately these have been discontinued. I really like them though, because I can just use 1.5 liter soft drink bottles to store three liters of water all inside my frame. This bike is essentially the pinnacle of what is available. If you're into cars, the equivalent would be a top model Mercedes-Benz with every optional extra. The World Traveler starts at 2,600 euros with derailleur gearing, with a roll-off hub, it's 3,500 euros. With a roll-off hub and belt drive, it's 3,800 euros. And if you select every upgrade like I have, expect to pay a bit over 5,000 euros. I'm really looking forward to following the smallest roads from Panama to Alaska. If you're interested in following my journey, hit that subscribe button or give this video a like or follow me on Instagram, at cyclingabout. Ciao.